You will still sometimes encounter judges with unusual opinions about what should be expected of reply speeches. It's absolutely the case that you don't want to give a prior a broomstone reply speech in general. That's considered a, still pretty on the nose. But you do need, you do have the capacity to be a little bit more flexible than you used to be. So I want to go through that just so you don't panic when you go online and see guides to giving reply speeches that tell you things that sound bizarre. Um, so what's currently expected? It's a pretense of impartiality, and that's reflected in your manner. It's reflected in your choice of words, your speaking tone and delivery, your body language. And I'd like to give you some kind of guide point. Everything I'm doing now in terms of presenting would be totally within the norm for a reply speech. There's motion, there's humor, there's light and shade, there's changes in tone and pacing. All of that is still totally fine in a reply speech. You will see reply speeches online that are delivered in a monotone. You do not need to imitate that. You are not required to be like that. To the extent to which a reply speaker appears partial, i.e. like they have a preference for one team over another, they're partial about the topic and they're partial about the arguments rather than being partial about the teams. So they might be angry, they might be offended, they might be passionate, but they're all of those things in the same way as you would expect a reasonable audience member or adjudicator to be. They're angry because someone said something that is worthy of outrage, not just because the other team made a good argument and they want to make it sound like that argument was ridiculous. So you just have to pick your battles with manner a little bit more carefully than you would in a third speech or a first speech or a second speech because you're supposed to be pretending to be impartial. And the reason you want to think about that is if you imagine that you are delivering a consensus adjudication, so the chairperson on a panel, and you've got two other adjudicators with you, and so you're talking about what the result should be, and one of those adjudicators turns to you, and sounds like they really care about which team wins in a way that doesn't really sound like it's about the arguments. They're just really passionate about one team in the debate and they really insist that that team won. They're not really taking that step back. They sound really emotionally invested. You would wonder, I would think, about whether that judge had a conflict. You would wonder about whether that judge was an impartial observer. In the same way, a reply speech is effectively pretending that we have picked up the first speaker of each side and put them on the adjudication panel. And now they're trying to justify and convince everyone else on that panel that their side won. So they've got to do that in a way that reflects the, the pretense, right? That reflects that you are pretending to be more impartial than you actually are. And that's going to really inform the manner that you use. So again, I'm going to show you some examples at the end. Standard rules of persuasiveness apply, and your manner should complement what you are saying. If something is worthy of outrage, please be outraged. Don't pretend that a monotone is appropriate for talking about slaughtering small children or anything like that. You do not need to do those things. Um, that is all good. Okay, structure. You don't have time for three things. People often, when they first start doing reply speeches, try and give them like mini third speaker speeches. You cannot fit all that material in a reply speech. You have to cut, you have to edit, you have to cull. So you have to think about what things would actually persuade the judge. Let's say the runners come into the room, they're grabbing a the ballot from the judge, they say, you've got three minutes, we're about to announce the next motion. What would your judge say to you about why you want that debate? What is left, what is crucial? They wouldn't rush through every argument that was made in the debate. They would not try and summarize every line of analysis. They would explain the key things that caused them to make the decision they made. So replies in the same way generally have two questions, directed towards summarizing the core clashes and why you won them. Replies also, for a variety of reasons, tend to get introductions pretty short. Now part of that is that if you're giving the negative reply, you are right after the third negative speaker. You do not need to reintroduce your case. Someone has just spent eight minutes talking about it. But part of it is also that a 45 second introduction in an eight minute speech is one thing. 45 second introduction in a four minute speech is a quarter of your speech. You cannot afford to do that. So reply speeches tend to dive straight in. They tend to be pretty strict about what they cover. We are going to talk about some exceptions. The clashes or the arguments that they discuss may or may not be the same as the third speaker. Generally, it will be the case that if the third speaker gives three clashes, the reply speaker takes two of them and kind of shoehorns the other one into one of the, those other two. Um, but they're not always exactly the same. They will sometimes be different. And again, we're going to talk about examples where it makes particular sense to talk about your themes or what happened in the debate in a subtly different way from your third speaker. Those do come up and they're worth thinking about. But generally, two themes, don't overdo it, and cull, edit, cut, anything that you don't think is actually why an adjudicator would award the debate to your side, cut it. You don't have time for it. Okay, content. Just as a judge would assume that teams remember what happened in the debate, a reply speech, 
like an adjudication. You don't need to go through every line of analysis. You do not need to redetail arguments. You can assume the judge remembers what was said. And so what you are often doing in a reply speech is saying, when we gave you this argument, heading of this argument, this is the implication it had for the debate. This is why it mattered. This is why it changed the debate. But you don't need to step through every point of analysis that was given in order to do that. The judge, just like you, knows what's already been said. So you can, again, that's one of those places where you edit. Beginner replies tend to become a little bit of a he said, she said litany. It's just like they said this, then we said this, then we said that, then they said this. That's not persuasive. No one is persuaded by a list of things that happened. And if they are, they're not a very reliable judge. So you are always editorializing. We said this, it was important because of this. When they gave this response, it did not work because of this. So there's always that explanation about why. And I get that that's stressful and hard because it is analysis, and analysis is stressful and hard when you're just starting out, but that's what you're aiming for. And again, I'm going to show you some examples at the end that do this really well. Um, yeah. And obviously, one of the things to remember here is there's a reason we have reply speeches. Reply speeches can win you a debate just like any other speech. Otherwise, we would not have them. They are not that interesting. They are really dull to listen to, and the debate has already been going on for an hour. So because a reply speech can change the result, you need to think about what value you are adding as a speaker. What are you bringing to the table that no one else has brought at this point? What things are you changing about the debate at the end of your, your speech? Now, just as sometimes you're the second speaker and you actually don't change the result of the debate, a lot of the time, reply speeches don't change the result of the debate. But the point is that that's what you're aiming for, the same way as you would for any other speech. And yet again, you're trying to give that overarching characterization. Why was your team more persuasive on this clash? Why did it matter that your team won this clash? Why was this argument important in the debate? Why did it matter that the other side didn't talk about it? Always think, what made this important? Why did we spend time on it? And which brings me to tactics. So I'm going to give you basically two types of reply. And this is going to sound a little bit technical. I promise we're going to show you some examples that will make it a bit easier. The first is the most simple. It's a reply speech that is basically structured like a shorter ne third negative speech or third affirmative speech. It's the same structure. You're just talking about clashes. And you're not adding new content when you talk about them, but you're doing it in basically the same way. Um, so when I say clash-based, I don't necessarily mean we had an argument about free speech and they had an argument about free speech. It's how did all of the arguments we had interact on a question of does this motion damage free speech? So you're kind of bringing things together in the same way as you would in a third speaker speech. These are really great when there have been major clashes and you know what they are and it's just a matter of which team has won them. But really what you need to do in your reply speech is spend your time persuading the judge that you won the arguments that matter or where there have been a lot of different clashes. The debate's been a bit of a mess. There's been a lot of things covered. But you know which ones you need to convince the adjudicator matter. You know which ones you need to convince the adjudicator you've won on. You have a clear idea of the grounds on which you think you can win this debate. The second version, um, and these were pretty uncommon when I started, so they're still they're a little bit cutting edge in the debating world, um, are chronological. They focus on how the debate developed and changed. And these often don't have two tidy themes. They're often much more like there's one question and we're going to talk about how it evolved during the debate. Um, but essentially what you're doing with these is you're tracking how the debate changed. A bad version of these is just at first speaker we said this, at first speaker they said that, at second speaker we responded. A good version of this says, at first speaker we told you this thing was really important. They tried to combat with this, but when they realized during our second speaker speech that that was nonsense, they then entirely changed their case and they ran this completely different idea at second. And the reason that you might be doing a chronological um, reply speech in that case is that tracking why you are winning at every point in that debate is how you bump up your margins and how you deal with a judge who's maybe a bit confused about what happened or hasn't quite realized how intention a case is. Or maybe your case has changed and you need to give a justification for why you changed it over time and why you should still win the debate. So a chronological case is a case that is a little bit more complicated. It's still worth getting some experimentation in doing them. And these are, again, most useful when the debate's been a bit of a mess and people have changed what they're doing. Now, I do want to give a caveat here. These are two broad examples. They are not every possible way you can give a reply speech. 
Different people will do reply speeches in different ways. There is no mandate at any speech in Australs that you give an exact particular structure. You can always do something different. You want to do a rebuttal at the end of a speech? Great. If that works for you and works for that debate, do it. You want to completely change the order and do your introduction in the middle of your speech? I'm fine with that if you can find a reason that that makes sense. So, in the same way, a reply speech does not have to follow any one of these particular structures, and many of the best reply speeches are more cutting edge than that. They've worked out what they need to do for their team to win, and they're going to do whatever it takes to make that happen, and the structure is going to follow that. So don't feel like you have to stick to anything in particular. Flip side of that, if you're just getting started, give them formulaic things. You've got to learn your building blocks before you try and get too creative, otherwise you'll just go completely off rails. You, you should give like a good five or ten reply speeches before you start experimenting, just as you wouldn't experiment that much with structure when you're giving your first third of permanent speech. You kind of give yourself a little bit of time to get used to it. Alright, impact on other speeches. I said earlier that the, the negative gives their reply speech before the affirmative, and that means there is 12 uninterrupted minutes of negative material and we have no points of information at Australs. So that is 12 totally uninterrupted minutes. That's a lot, and you only have four minutes if you're the affirmative team to undo that. So this really does change the tactics of the debate. If you're the affirmative team, your third affirmative speech is going to be followed by 12 uninterrupted minutes. Your reply speech, which will follow that, cannot add new content of any kind, and only lasts for four minutes. So it is really important at third affirmative that you plan for that. Your summaries and your conclusions become really important. You want to leave the judge with a sense that the debate is already over before the negative stands up, because again, 12 and uninterrupted minutes. And you also need to, even though the, your reply speaker is not going to be speaking for a while, you need to be coordinating with them. Because when they do stand up, you want the judge to be thinking, oh yes, everything the third affirmative said. This debate was already over, this neg block made no difference, rather than, oh, this is completely new. Right? So it's really important you do that coordination. On the flip side, on the negative, you have your 12 uninterrupted minutes, don't waste them. You need to coordinate. That particularly means that while conclusions become really important on the affirmative, why is the negative giving a conclusion their first speak is about to stand up again for four minutes? So you can be a little bit more selective about what you spend your time on at third negative because you're about to have a four minute summary of your case. So you don't need to be the one doing that. You can be a little bit more um, tactical about what you cover. But it also, you still need to coordinate. You don't want to have a situation where your third negative stands up, gives one great interesting conceptualization of the debate, and then the reply speaker stands up and gives a totally contradictory one. Even if you win on both versions of that, that's going to be jarring and it's going to cause your adjudicator to instead of thinking, ah oh, yes, they're winning, to think what's going on here? And does it mean that there's something wrong with their case? What should I be looking for in terms of problems? So it's really important you still do that coordination. All right, judging replies, and then we're going to get into some examples. Again, they can change the outcome of the debate, or we would have gotten rid of them a long time ago. They're boring. No one really loves them. Um, but a reply speech is very dependent on the material that already exists in the debate. So a team that is clearly losing is going to struggle to give an excellent reply to a much greater extent than they might struggle to give an excellent third speech because they can't even add a new rebuttal. So if they have no material to win with, their reply is, you know, it might be structurally great, it might be stylistically great, but it's not going to be particularly good. Um, but like any speech, a good reply is still a reply that would be likely to change your mind in favour of the team if you did not already believe that they had won. And a bad reply is the opposite. And to be honest, really good replies often what they're best at is causing the judge to massively overweight material that already occurred or underweight it to change their opinion of a first speech or change their opinion of a second speech. There are very few people who do this well and I had a good hunt around but I couldn't find an example that was an excellent standalone without having watched the debate. It's something you will come across where you'll be sitting there going, hang on, that didn't sound nearly as good when the first speaker said it, but this, this reply speaker has made it sound like this was great from the start and you will find judges who are massively swayed by that and then won't particularly reward the reply speaker, but the first affirmative's points go up by two. Um, so you will find those, they are rare. Um, most good reply speakers are just generally internally persuasive. You come out of them thinking better of the team and therefore you score them well. Um, and I should say here, 
You, as a judge, have a bit of a duty to be alert to that first case. You should be rewarding the reply speaker, not the first speaker when that happens. I get that it's insidious and hard to spot, but part of your job as a judge is to try and do that. So you should be a little bit alert to. This changed my opinion. I thought that material was not particularly good. Now I'm convinced it's debate winning. I need to go back and look at my notes because I need to make sure I'm not crediting the first speaker with that when it's actually the reply speaker who's made that sound persuasive. So please do, do be a little bit alert to that. But to be honest, when it comes to judging reply speeches, you're asking yourself the same kind of questions, they're just subtly different. Would this reply, did this reply speech cast other speeches from that team in a better light? Did it cast other speeches from the other team in a worse light? Did it influence how I weighted arguments? Did it make the arguments sound more persuasive than they were at a time? If a panelist said this to me in a consensus adjudication, would I think they were right? Would I be persuaded by them? And remember in all of this, the question you're asking yourself is not, did this actually change my mind? Because God knows what you believe. You can believe all kinds of weird things about debates that you're watching personally. But you as a judge have to put that aside. Would the average, reasonable, collectivized audience respond positively to this? Would they think better of the team as a result? Um, finally, just quickly in terms of scoring, it's generally easiest to just score, as you saw with Ms. Rockwood and Max at the start of this, Score them out of 100 divided by 2 um, is much easier and you'll get the right score as a result of doing it that way. Otherwise, people often score reply speeches clumsily. There are obviously half marks available in reply speeches. They are literally 50% um, of, of a full speech. So it's a lot easier to be like, that reply speech was excellent, it was a 79, and then divide that in 2 on a calculator rather than trying to score that that speech is a 39.5 because um, you will get that wrong frequently. Um, so, so yeah, we will um, leave that. So I'm going to pull up some examples for you now, um, and we're going to watch some of them. I won't necessarily play all of these through, um, but I'm going to watch the debate that came before them. So it's not necessarily useful to watch them all the way through. You don't really know what happened in the debate. This is more to give you a little bit of a reference <laughs> um, for what a reply speech might look like and how it might go. So the first one I'm going to give you um, is a reply speech uh, around when I first started debating, so a decade ago. Um, what, I, what I want to show you from this is what kind of matter used to be pretty normal, and I will say this is a very, 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 very good reply speech. This is an excellent reply speech, but to a modern ear, modern debating ear, it's not going to sound like one. It's important for you to have a little bit of that context if you're going to go back and Um, and this was at the upper end. 
What you'll start to see as you watch more recent reply speeches um, is that they are a lot more dynamic, they are a lot more vibrant, um, and they are a lot more kind of creative in terms of the ways in which they might emphasize content. So I'm going to show you what I'm going to call an upper limits example. And I will give you a warning that this is a terrible recording. It was live streamed on a laptop from the side of the stage. Um, but this is a great reply speech. This is also the absolute upper limits, I think, of what you can get away with in terms of partiality in a reply speech. Um, and it's really good for it, but you don't want to be more emotive than this. You don't want to be more angry than this. You don't want to be more outrageous than this. This is really the, the limits of what you can get away with. This is um, a guy called Asher, who's a great Nick Wellington debater. Um, I'm the king of course, you don't tell. Look at me. I have no problem. People will tell you that I have a bit of um, overt tendency to refer to the best too much. <laughs> I have no other grappling hook or truths in this world, and I'm not going to go down that path that I see you this evening. But that's a super duper important question in this debate, and has really not gone resolved for want of engagement from the affirmative bench. And that's why I am somewhat distressingly entitling my first point what is truth? After that, we're going to proceed to what were the bad things, and then what were the good things in the debate. What is truth then? Because they came up and used the shorthand of rationality and irrationality to refer to some kind of system of identifying what was good and what was bad. We told you that that was called a value system that was fundamentally indistinguishable from a religious value system. They never had any sound objection to that, except for this notion that this value system is an exclusionary one, and that value system was a non-exclusionary one. The problem there was, did they ever articulate for you how the bland melange of like late capitalist malaise was somehow non-exclusionary for you, right? Like, you dress up in prettier clothes to be a part of a prettier group, or a more a socially outstanding group, whatever that might be, right? And so when they told you that we're going to believe in plurality and believe in more of like diversity, it's like plurality of what? After you have asked people apparently what they want to believe in and what their value systems are, but have presupposed the answer on their behalf and replaced with something which was never clearly explained. Counterintuitive, I know, to say this in the debate because we're all locked into a particular bubble. But there really is no difference between humanism and belief in God. We resolve that in a democratic fashion where we respect people's ability to determine their own subjective preferences in the world. That's reason enough for us to this debate. Let's talk about the good and the bad things. What are they think about things? Public holidays, tax breaks, breaks, and literary history being poisoned with the Bible. Firstly, like, that's not out of the debate. That's just general secular positions that we don't support, say, being used on religious religions for harm. Then there was this notion of the exclusionary narratives that we've already dealt with. But more important was this idea that religion never changes, right? That was where they hung most of their hat. Because if they persuaded you that religion is fundamentally exclusionary in ways that other value systems are not, then they tell you you should prefer those other value systems because religion can never walk into a manner which is more likely to include other people. Nick dealt with that quite well, but there was never also a substantial response to the analysis Joe gave you about the process of moderation in the church. That began, she you notes, in my first speech, where I explained to you the reasons why it was the church generally tended towards progress. Nothing more than the repeated, repeated bland assertion that religion is forever static. Let's talk then about why religion is good. And this is one of the first times I've made this case, and I can tell you it's been actually a really great pleasure. Religion imposed the state. And what did they say? I'm going to cut him off there. It is actually worth watching in full because it's just very fun. Um, but, it, but I think that probably gives you a little bit of a sense of where that upper limit is. You could imagine an adjudicator giving that speech as an adjudication in a debate where one side had really stuffed up the motion. And you can, and some of you will have experienced this, adjudicators are coming and saying, look, this was not good, I'm going to tell you why. And this is very much that speech. Um, but it is absolutely the upper limit. An adjudicator who was more mocking than that would be pretty out of line and possibly reported to the Ash Corps or the equity team. This is like the absolute upper limits of what you can get away with in a reply speech because it is the absolute upper limits of what you might be able to get away as a judge in a context where the participants knew you well, in a context where you had good faith uh, belief in your abilities already. So 
enjoy this because it is enjoyable, but also be aware that it's setting your upper bounds to a certain extent. All right. Next, next example I'm going to give you is what I'm going to call roughly the kind of modern standard, which is not standard because it's a very good reply speech, but it's kind of what you would expect to see as a tone and approach for a reply speech. Most the of the time, speaker from side negative, Paul Carr. the affirmative moral cause was the potential was being destroyed by abortion. It was to disable people who were told that their lives weren't worth living uh, because it, that is a sufficient harm to justify the use of the criminal law. And it was to the women who weren't able to control their bodies because community standards was now the justification for taking away their bodily autonomy. Let's look at the two issues of the debate. Firstly, the balance of rights, and secondly, the effectiveness of the law. Firstly, on the balance of rights. The affirmative told us that you don't have an unfettered right to treat your children as you like. We told you that the, that the fetuses are not yet people. The affirmative said that it was sufficient in this debate that the fetuses would in future be a person. We were able to show you that they're not necessarily going to become people, but anything could happen in the meantime like a miscarriage, so that this model was put, in fact punishing an intention to cause harm to a future person that may never come into existence. We then showed you the other case, the more likely case, is that you would have an incentive then to get an abortion to prevent that person ever coming to existence in a way that would make you criminally liable. Their response in this debate the second was to say that there was no harm to that because if the fetus was never born, then there just couldn't be any harm. We brought you two compelling harms. The first was the... So I'm going to pause there. We may listen to a little bit more of this, but I think this is a really great example of content and structure in a reply speech, as well as a really good example of manner and style. Um, in particular, listen to those kind of, they told us there was no compelling reason to do this, we gave you two compelling reasons type formulation. What he's doing every time he does that is saying, here is the, the, the kind of burden they set up, here's the bar they said we had to meet, here's how we met it. Here's where they say there's a problem, here's how we showed it wasn't a problem. So when I said earlier that you're editorialising in these reply speeches, this is a really clean example of it. There's not too much else going on. It's just that editorialisation. They said this, here's why it didn't matter. We said this, here are the harms that made it really important. And so this is the kind of structure as well as the kind of tone that you're most likely to want to aim for. Um, as I said again, this is a really good reply speech. It's not as laugh out loud as the other one I showed you. It's much more in the line of what you might normally expect to see. But it's also a really good structural example of the type of things that you're trying to prove. So listen to the next, or we'll play another 30 seconds or so. Listen out for those contrast points in the language that's being used to do them, because this is a really good example of how someone can do that and make it sound organic and natural. The message that some lives are not worth living, because while some people will be aborted for this, we showed you that other people born with disability in society are now harmed by an affirmative model that says that that was a sufficient harm and a sufficiently suboptimal life to justify the use of the criminal law. That was disgusting. The second harm we brought you was my material about why it might be better for them to exist, to be brought into existence. It was never clear in this debate why the affirmative would, would incentivize, or in an attempt to consider decreasing the potential benefit of someone's life, were prepared to obliterate the, the potential for that life altogether. And that if they were prepared to consider the harm to the fetus now of, some, of living a suboptimal life in the future, then why not the potential benefit to existing of someone in the future who would otherwise be aborted as a consequence of this model? Secondly, in the balance of rights, we told, we told you that they'd never shown that living with a disability was bad enough to justify criminal law. We think it was largely conceded by their case by the piss weak model of community, ser sentence, uh, community service as so light that that is absolutely not analogous to how we treat people who are abusive to their children or that inflict disability on a real life person. We think this indicated it was not a sufficient harm. They didn't really believe in this standard. Last thing it um, so again, what I'm asking you to look for in these speeches, and it is genuinely worth going and watching some Austral's videos online and getting some examples of reply speeches, I, I will say that because 
complex speeches are not the most enjoyable thing to give. Everyone knows that, it's a reality. You will often do tournaments where you see very, very few good reply speeches because of that. People often treat them as an afterthought. There's a reason you're doing this session in week 12, right? Like, <laughs> we, don't, we don't introduce you to debating with this stuff because this is not the most fun bit of it. But what that often means in practice is that it is really hard to see good examples of reply speeches. You will not organically see them a lot of the time. Um, and even in societies that have excellent reply speakers, most of the debates you will do in the Austral semester of the year will not use reply speeches. Most of the tournaments you go to in the Austral semester of the year will not use reply speeches. So if you are first getting started doing them and you are just learning for the first time how to do it, it is so worthwhile seeing some good examples of having a sense of what to aim for, because otherwise you will do weird things. To be honest, you'll see examples that are not great, will not have contrast points for that, and you will aim for things that are weird. As best I can tell, that's how we ended up with a decade of people talking in a modern time. It wasn't because the rules said they had to, it's because those were the examples that they were seeing. That was what they were learning to focus on. A great reply speech, a really good one, just like maybe actually all three of these examples, is actually a joy to listen to. It's actually engaging, it's actually enjoyable, in the same way as a great adjudication is interesting and has shade of light and is persuasive. So much of the time they end up being much flatter than that. And by flatter, I don't even mean that first example I showed you where the style is quite flat, but the actual content is quite dynamic and the tactics that play are quite interesting. I mean flat generally. I mean a litany of this is a thing that was said, that's a thing that was said, that's a thing that was said, these are all the arguments that were made on free speech, my next point. No one wants to see that, that's not why we have reply speeches. Now that's not to say that you're like, disappointing anyone when you give reply speeches like that, because frankly that's the bar. Um, the, but the point is that you can do more with them, you can do better with them, and it is worth seeing some great examples of them. Um, I'm just around, I'm going to judge and debate. I'm sure that there's going to be some arrangements for other people to do that and give you some feedback on them. For those of you who are trying out reply speeches, relax, it's all okay. Just giving them a go. For those of you who've done them before, um, let your judge know at the start of the debate if you've done them before and are trying something new or you're getting experimental with something or you want feedback on a particular point, just like every speech, it's worth getting that. Um, and for those of you who aren't giving reply speeches, make the time to do them at some point. For those of you who are in Austral's teams and know you're never going to do them this semester, I get that that might not be this semester, but don't not do them because eventually you will end up in a team where you have to. Um, and it is worth at that point being able to do them. Um, so please make a chance to do them, give it a go. Um, and more importantly, think tactically about them and don't just leave your first speaker writing them in a corner of the table and check in on them 30 seconds before they stand up because that's also not how you learn to give good reply speeches and it's not fun for them. Um, all right, thank you everyone. I might hand over, I think, Yes, absolutely. We can do questions. I just want to make sure we're not eating into your pizza break. So, Barry, please cut me off. When. Pizza is coming until six thirty. So, oh, shame. All right, I can definitely do half an hour of questions. All right, go ahead. Right. Firstly, judge. Um, because reply speeches, manner-wise, are very bounded to the kind of adjudications that you give. Uh, that is acceptable to give. Judging is one of the best ways to learn how to do them, to be honest, because you are effectively giving an extended reply speech every time you give an adjudication. In terms of style, if not necessarily exactly in terms of content, and it's a good way also to get a great sense of which arguments are winning a debate and which arguments are shifting the way a debate is seen and what things a team might want to emphasize more in order to change how that debate is going. So having that tactical sense of what's happening really does feed into reply speeches. Um, the second thing I'd say is that it's, it's never all that useful to just give speeches to yourself in front of the mirror. Um, and I get that there's a lot of kind of fetishization around the idea of wake up every morning and give your first affirmative speech. It'll teach you how to give a decent first affirmative speech in a vacuum. It's not going to teach you exactly how you need to interact with other teams. It's often going to train bad habits because what you will learn from doing it is well, you don't get corrected. The mistakes that you make go uncorrected and you can really drill down on those bad habits. If no one is telling you, you need to stop doing that. Or if there were three speeches after you, someone would have noticed that thing that you did. Where they are often useful is actually listening to partial debates. 
Um, so literally, like, grab a couple of Austral's videos, watch up to the third speech, and then give a reply speech. Because in those kind of situations where you're giving a speech in a context of a debate that's already happening, it's much harder to fall into bad habits because there are already problems that exist that you know need you now you you know you need to fix. So there are some things that you can do around that, and it is actually I, I would genuinely recommend for those of you who are really interested in learning how to give reply speeches and haven't done them before, it really is okay to just watch a debate, write a reply speech, and give it to yourself. Um, it is an okay thing to do. I really do recommend doing at least a couple of them even if you're not able to get additional feedback on top of that. Um, yeah, I think those are probably the two things I'd focus on in terms of, in terms of how to do them. Um, and then finally, I guess, just think strategically about debates. Reply speeches are to a very large extent just distilled strategy. It's four minutes of your team's strategy. And if you're great at strategy and have a really good sense of it, it's going to make you a good reply speaker. Yes? Say you're losing the debate. Yeah. Well, not necessarily losing, but you have some gaping hole in your case that you've realised now at the third leg and you've gone, oh my god, they're pointing out this huge flaw in my case. What can you do in a reply to make up for it? Because you can't pretend you have that bit of the case there. Yeah. And it's going to look pretty bad if you go, that didn't match up. We never had to prove this thing. What so the first thing I'd say is the second thing is exactly what you're going to do 99% of the time. Um, what you are actually going to do is explain why you didn't have that thing, right? So it might be a glaring gaping hole, but people win with glaring gaping holes in their case all the time. And it doesn't mean you stand up and be like, oh, yeah, we didn't have that. It's more you stand up and go, look, I don't know why third affirmative was so interested in this argument that has nothing to do with this debate. This debate was about... Um, so, so what you essentially want to do in that context is really drive home why the things that were in the debate were more important. Now where it becomes more of a problem is not where like you did a debate about legalising prostitution and you did nothing on the freedom for people to choose what to do with their bodies. It's not going to be like there's a whole argument missing. That's actually much easier to deal with because you can just be like, you know, this debate wasn't particularly about that and that's okay because we won on this other material. Where it's more of an issue is where you're missing a basic premise, right? <laughs> like. You've, you've done an argument and you've completely forgotten to explain a crucial element. The first thing that you can do in that kind of situation is to do a little bit of work to explain why it was implied, right? So if it's genuinely such a foundational premise, there's a certain amount that you can do to be like, look, when we gave you that argument about free choice, obviously a premise of that was that people have bodily autonomy. We don't understand why the affirmative seems to, the negative seems to think we had to explain that. Bodily autonomy is a very basic concept, right? So you can do a certain amount to be like, yeah, okay, we didn't spend a lot of time on that premise, but here's why the argument stands without it. Um, and you can, you can do a certain amount tactically with that, often in much the same way as you might in a, in like if you were asked to appear why on the spot and just didn't have the answer about a premise, that you'd explain why your argument stood even without it. The final thing that you can do, um, even when you are just missing that premise, is that in the same way as you might, I don't recommend this most of the time, most of the time it's not necessary, but sometimes it's worthwhile to have in your arsenal. Let's say you're having a consensus adjudication, and you're really convinced the affirmative team won, but there is just a glaring hole in their case. And everyone knows it, there's a thing that's missing that they should have said. But you think there are reasons they won, even though maybe they lost that argument in a really bad way, right? It was a big part of their case, they stuffed it up, the other team's shown why they stuffed it up, but you still think they won. Think about what you would say as a panelist to explain that. And you can just acknowledge the elephant in the room, right? Look, the affirmative is right. We could have done more work on this particular argument. Here's why it doesn't matter. Here's why we win regardless. And when it comes to building credibility, which is what you're doing in every speech, credibility can be built in a whole wide range of ways. You can stand up and sound authoritative. That builds credibility. But one of the ways that human beings assume and grant credibility to people is to assume that they're being honest and to have evidence that they're being honest and upfront. And so big credibility building technique is actually genuinely acknowledging when there are gaps, when there are things you don't know, when there are things that are missing from your case. Not because like you want to do that as like your default, ideally you do know everything, but because it's actually more credible to be honest about what was missing than it is to be like, yeah, we had all of that. Remember, it was there in that speech you have notes about, where it's definitely not. And you sound really non-credible when you do that, 
Whereas if you just say, you're right, we, we didn't have that premise, it is a problem. Here's why it's a problem that doesn't defeat our case. Um, and, and it is genuinely worth having that in your arsenal. Yeah? Um, you So the first thing I'd say is that particularly your third speaker and your reply speaker should speak about five minutes before your third speaker stands up. And that can be as little as like 30 seconds, all right, what are you thinking? Um, I would normally do it as the second speaker sits down, right? So you've got a bit of time to plan and strategize. And then you're really only checking in after that if something's changed, right? You're listening to the third speaker from the other side and you're like, oh, we've got to change this. But so you have a bit of a strategy early on. It's the biggest thing you can do to help because the last thing you want when you're writing a speech is a litany of advice coming in your ear. So if you've got agreement on what you need to cover, that's going to make that a lot easier and that's often on other team members. Because like if your third speaker is stressing out and panicking writing an eight minute speech, you don't want it to be on the reply speaker that, no, seriously, come on, we need to talk about this. You want that to be something that happens with the team. Secondly then, be pretty selective about what information you give your reply speaker. If you think about it this way, your reply speaker, one of their biggest roles is editing down. It's identifying what they absolutely have to talk about. Oh, I thought of this killer idea about the thing they've just said right now is 90% of the time not going to be useful information for them to receive because they've already edited that argument out of their speech, right? So it's really important not to flood them with information. Think about what they've got as their themes. What are the big goals that are in their reply speech? Give them things that fit into that well so that you have that strategy as well in what you're giving them. And if you're going to give them something that you're looking at and going, oh, yeah, it doesn't really fit into anything they're talking about, be pretty selective. Like, this is, we're going to win the debate or we're going to lose deba the debate on the basis of this territory. Because that really is what a reply speech is. There isn't room for a lot of fluff. So really be selective. That can also sometimes mean that you want to write things down. Different people will have different preferences about that. I always prefer to have someone whisper than to write. Um, but it does depend and it's worth strategizing about that with your, with your reply speaker in advance. Um, and then just the final thing I would do is as the third speaker sits down, they want to give the reply speaker a bit of an update. I don't think I really landed this particular point. I know you've got it, you need to drill onto it a little bit more than I did. I think I really smashed this, so for short for time, you can probably cut that bit type stuff. Because often the reply speaker hasn't really been paying too much attention to the third speaker's speech if things have been going well. All right, other questions? Um, so, two things. Yeah. Um, Let's do them one at a time if they're not related, because otherwise I'll get... It was kind of related okay. to just a comment, which is just that in the TJ example you showed, um, in that tournament, every single reply speech he did, a mid wrote the introduction for it, which is one of the reasons why his manner was a little stilted going up there. He possibly never read it before. But he's also just to underline the point, write down your introduction. Oh, God, yes. Anyway. Second thing um, goes back to the sort of interaction on the on the teams. Um, one of the stories I tell people um, is about when you were on Monash One with Kieran and Chris. One of the things you would do is have a huddle, like sometime midway through the debate, and ask, "Why are we losing this debate?" Can you talk about that in sort of a practical example and how that then impacts what you do with the third and what you do with the reply? Absolutely. I will say it wasn't novel to us either. There are a lot of great teams that have done it. Um, and the other thing that we did that I just highly recommend in an Austral's team that most teams do not do, we had one sheet of A4 paper. It was divided in half. On one side was every argument we were going to make, and we wrote that before the debate. On the other side, and we all wrote on this, it was just dot points, what the other team had said, and we literally highlighted them out as we knew that we'd responded to them to make sure we never got to a case where we got to the third speaker's speech and we're like, damn it, we didn't say anything about that argument. That's, that's really a disaster. So that kind of tracking is hugely important. It's not something you can just do in a huddle, um, but that is basically the purpose that the huddle serves. What are we winning on? What are we losing on? What do we need to change? And again, yeah, I would generally recommend doing that at the end of the second speaker's speeches, which puts you basically halfway through the debate. Um, or like you do it halfway through the other second speaker's speech, it's just like where do we need to strategize, what do we need to change. Now that conversation basically takes a couple of forms, because it does depend on what's happening in the debate. That conversation might be, we are losing this debate, our strategy is not working and we need to change. And if you're thinking that, you want to do it before your second speaker's speech, because you need to get some new arguments up there. Um, 
So you want to be pretty alert to that and you'll often just be able to see that on that sheet of A4 paper you're passing back and forth. They seem to be winning this and we are not landing blows here. Um, secondly, things are going broadly well, right? You think you are winning and the, the better you get at debating, the more you have an accurate sense of that and you generally, once you're pretty good at this, can get, get it right 90% of the time. Um, that conversation changes. The first thing is, how do we run up the margin? Right? Because if you're winning that debate, your margins matter. You don't want to be the team that misses out on speaks because you're just one point below because you didn't go hard enough in the third round. So, how do we run up the margins on this? We've won these arguments. What do we do to make us win by a bigger margin? That might be, okay, we've really won these arguments. We actually want to add additional reasons that we've won. So, what things haven't we won yet? What things can we drive on? We've won these arguments, we can make the consequences seem bigger. How do we drive those up? We can spend our time there. That kind of strategic discussion really informs a third speaker speech and by virtue of a reply speaker speech. The second thing I'd keep in mind in terms of doing this is that it is worth always asking yourself, we think we're winning, if we're wrong, why would that be? The adjudicator stands up at the end of the debate and says you lost, what reasons are they going to give? And you have to be really honest with yourself when you're doing this. It's no, there's no point having that conversation if what you're going to say is, we, lost, we would have lost because the adjudicator is an idiot. Like that, that's not useful. You have to ask yourself, if they were genuinely right, what would be that revelation? Now, most of the time when you ask yourself that question, your answer will be, yeah, we know what we're losing, it's fine, we know what we need to correct. Every now and then just asking yourself that though and really digging into it is going to prompt you to realise that you have completely missed a characterisation of the debate on which they are winning. Um, and you particularly want to know that before the reply speaker speech because that kind of characterisation work is exactly what a reply speaker does. So we would often have that conversation with Chris who spoke um, first into our replies and it would be a conversation that would essentially go, okay, we think we're winning this, this and this. But if the judge thinks this is really valuable, we are totally screwed because we've got next to nothing on that argument. We are, we will just lose. So how do we make that characterization sound not realistic about the debate? Now, all of this is pretty dynamic, and it's stuff where I can't be like, we did it this one time and it saved us from this. Because a lot of the time it was small little adjustments, little stuff. But it is worth always asking yourself that. One of the things I think people often lose sight of in debates is it's very easy to get focused on your own speech, but debating is ultimately a team sport. And you will do your best, you will speak your best if you have collaborated with everyone else who is with you. They will fix things that you wouldn't have thought of, you will fix things they wouldn't have thought of, you will have less cleaning up to do because they didn't even say that thing that would have been a problem. So you've got to be having those check-ins, and it's not just once a debate, every time a speaker sat down, we'd have a moment where we'd come together, okay, where are we? Like, where are you? Where's your speech? How are you ready? What is your material? Um, I also used to, um, so I spoke second, um, and in BP format, which for those of you haven't done, don't stress about it, you'll learn about it next semester. I spoke deputy, um, an extension. I would, after I'd written my speech, hand it to my first speaker. Um, so I would write my speech, I would write my content, my first speaker would sit down from his speech, I would hand him my speech, and he would then go through it. Because that's a really useful thing for him to be doing when he's given his speech, it's not far enough into the debate to start planning a reply speech. He needs to start thinking about what he's going to, what I might need to change, or whether there are things that I need to hammer that he thought I was talking about that I'm not talking about. So literally, swap your speeches, pass them around the bench, write each other notes, everything. You want to be making sure that you've got every bit of insight that exists in your team, in your head, before you stand up. You don't want it to be a situation where you sit down and they go, Oh wait, I thought you were going to say that. All right, other questions? Um, so going back to the slides earlier about what your teammates can do when you have to reply. So when you're in negative and you have a negative reply coming up, does that mean your third negative speech can just be about, like, say, 80% of it just giving responses to the other zero? Or like even 100% of it? Um, just turn my Yes, essentially. But I do want to be clear here. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't do that comparative work. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't do that strategic work where you might explain why winning an issue matters. What it mostly means is you know that someone's going to devote four minutes to that, 
So the focus of your speech can be different. You still want to weave through that line of, you know, here's why us winning this argument that I've just gone into a lot of detail about matters. But you're also doing that to set up your touchstones for your reply speaker speech. One of the things that often works really well persuasively is a sense of synergy. If an adjudicator keeps hearing that same thought, keeps getting on that same page, that same wavelength, that's really persuasive. That actually works really well for most people. So if your adjudicator is sitting there and they're like, oh yeah, the reply speaker says this thing, and I remember that, the third speaker said that, and actually kind of it was there in the second, this all feels like it comes together, and it feels like that point's being driven home. And debate, we talk about debate a lot of the time as like, you do this technical thing and it's rewarded with this number of points. We, we often get into that mindset. Debate is ultimately a persuasive art form. And there is no difference between winning a debate because you bamboozled your adjudicator and winning debate because they recognize the tactical advantage and brilliance of your, your strategy, right? Like, those points count the same. Um, and it, and there, you will come across adjudicators who are savvy enough to be like, ah, oh, I see what you did there, three points. But you will also come across a lot of adjudicators who are not that savvy. And remember, Austral's judging, not consensus. It's ballot judging. The ballot from the panelist who's just been promoted from a trainee counts just the same as the ballot from the chair. So you need to, you need to work to the highest and the lowest denominators with speeches, right? If you've got a panel of three and one of them's a bit lost, well, their ballot also counts. Um, so it really, like, when I say that those points count the same, Quite frankly, bamboozling your judge is often more useful. Um, they, if, if they genuinely just believe that you said that thing that you carefully pretended you'd already said in your reply speech, great. If they just recognize the tactical brilliance with which you pretended material added up to something that it hadn't added up to reward you for that, also great. But they are more likely to be the former. So you've got to strategize around that. If you're at reply and the name reply has things that you're like, oh dear lord, we didn't think those were the themes of this debate at all, but now that I've listened to that reply, I'm convinced they are. How do you sort of implicitly respond to it? Well, firstly, good on them, because they just bamboozled you. Right? When I say that part of the point of a reply speech is to convince your audience that the, the things that you think are important are the things that are important, that's what that reply speech just did. So don't take it at face value. Right? Maybe those aren't the themes. Maybe they didn't win those points. And the fact that you're thinking that is exactly what they want the adjudicator to be doing. So interrogate it. And that means that there's kind of two broad things you might be doing. The first is you might go, oh, they said they said that, but they didn't really say that. That wasn't nearly as persuasive when they actually analyzed it. This is just a very clever tactical reply. And then what you want to do, because there's nothing people hate more than realizing they've been bamboozled, is explain to your judge how that happened, right? Because <laughs> if your judge is sitting there being like, you tricked me, those dastardly, that's great. That's exactly what you want. Um, on the flip side, maybe they're right. Maybe you really did completely miss the boat and the debate's been a completely different debate from the one you thought it was. We can't do anything about that now. So the question is what you do do. Sometimes, exactly the same as point one, right? Why not bamboozle the judge into thinking they're being bamboozled? So then they're angry about having been bamboozled, but call the bamboozler. And you can do it, right? <laughs> like that's the point of a reply speech, is all of the tactics. Sometimes though, all you're gonna do is just really focus on what you can do. And I wanna be clear here, look, sometimes you're gonna lose debates, right? The real difference between a good team and a great team is that when a great team loses debates, they minimize how badly they lose them by. They get that margin as small as possible. So even if you're sitting there being like, there's no way we can win this, you can at least stem your losses. You can at least limit how bad the bleeding is. So that might mean that what you're doing is making the debate just sound narrower, right? Maybe, that, maybe what you're doing is just make it clear that they too are ignoring relevant material, right? Make it clear that the material that you made was really good and worthy of reward, even if the judge thinks you lost. There's a lot that you can do to do that. And look, you know, five points and speaks breaks you at Austral's. Five points and not speaks doesn't. So the difference between those matters, and it's really important that you have some, 
some ability to adapt to what's going on. The worst thing you can do, and I've been there, I have done it, is to lose a debate, feel like you're losing a debate, feel like you're about to put yourself out of great contention, and panic. What you instead want to do is just limit the damage. Plan, 
Think about what you're going to do if the tournament isn't providing food. Research in advance. Where can I get food cheaply? If I am ill, what medications do I need with me? How do I make myself sane throughout this tournament? I, I, I don't want to terrify first years, to be clear. <laughs> um, but Australians and Worlds are a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and if you flame out on day one, you can't come back from that. You do not have time to catch up on sleep. I have been to worlds where the maximum number of hours of sleep you could get per night, assuming you did not shower, did not eat breakfast, and did not eat dinner, was six hours. Because the tournaments were running that far behind schedule and there was that much of a transport delay. You need to be able to perform in those circumstances, not because it will always be like that, that worlds is recognized as the worst worlds ever for a reason, but because that is the difference between performing great and performing good. All right, any other questions? So the pizza is not here yet, so I'm happy to answer all thoughts, questions, and queries, reply related or not. Yes? Third speaker? All right. Um, the first thing I would say to you is that I think third speaker is pretty open to interpretation as to what works for you. The way that I always did my speeches, uh, like some people will divide pages in half and things like that. I always found that really confusing, was not useful for me at all. I wrote things in the order in which I was going to say them. Um, the last thing you want to do is get lost. That worked for me, did not work for, for most third speakers I knew. So you've got to be a little bit dynamic about how you, how you interpret that. The way that I structured all of my speeches was to start with headings. My first argument will be this, or my first question will be this, if it's third speaker. Then put in some headings for all of them. But subpoint this one, subpoint this two. Spread that out on over golden pages. Debating is not a tree friendly hobby. If you're cramming everything together, you will get lost. Um, one of my debate idols, um, Steph Bell, who's a brilliant Oxford speaker, spoke on, spoke every single debate of one sheet of A5, maybe A6 paper in a moleskin notepad in perfect little black writing. I have never met anyone else who could do it. Um, I could not do it, it is insane, do not do it. Space out, use different colours, use highlighters. Make it visually clear when you look down at your page what you're going to be talking about next. You need visual differentiation on every speech because you want to be able to glance down and know what you've already covered and what you still need to cover. And if all of your sheets look exactly the same, how do you keep track of where you are in them? So even if it's just having that visual geography on the page, right? So like. There's highlighter on some things, and so you can remember that you were below the bar of yellow highlighter and just subconsciously know where you need to go. That is so much better than cramming everything onto one page and then glancing down and being like, oh wait, where was I? The way that I did, I'll let you out some paper because I think this is done better visually. The way that I structured my speech is, so let's say this is my speech, it's massive. You, I wouldn't use quite that much paper, but seriously, not that far off. Um, when I came up, I would come up with my pages tiered. Um, and the reason that I do that, so see that there's multiple pages in each of those blocks, right? That's so I can see the headings of my arguments that are coming up. I can see all the headings, but I can't see anything else. Why is that important? Because it means I can't get distracted. Every time I look down, I can see what's coming in general, but I can mostly just see what I need to talk about. So I've got my first page. I've finished with it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to turn it over and put it out of the way. I'm not going to go back even if I've missed something. Why? Because if I go back, I'm going to completely lose track of my speech. I'm going to blow my timings. So every page, I'm going to take it, I'm going to put it aside, I'm going to turn it upside down. If you want to save paper, do reply speeches on the back, right? points information on the back, create a format that has them. But like, you need to be able to visually differentiate. I'm done with this, I'm moving on. I'm not going to get distracted. I can't see anything other than the point I need to be making right now at this specific moment in time. The reason all of that matters is because seconds do matter, and I get that that sounds really stressful, but like if you waste five seconds fumbling around, that's the best case scenario if you've gotten lost. Most of the time, if someone gets lost in their own notes, they never recover, right? Because you're lost, you've said something you're not supposed to say, so now you're actually two pages ahead of where you're supposed to be, and you've got to loop back, but then you're gonna to have to redo that analysis again because you didn't finish it, and you've just completely blown your timing. Something will have to give, you will miss material, you will drop things. So keep everything really visually clear. If you do want to do pages folded in half and like they said, we say type structure, that's fine. Make it really visually clear. This, then this, then this. Use arrows, use highlighters, use different colored pens. Um, Chris Bessett, who's one of my long-term speaking partners, used multiple colors of Sharpie. 
um, and they meant something to him. I wasn't that um, particular about it. Mine just mostly meant these colors are different and therefore I can visually see that I had moved from discussing one type of thing to discussing another type of thing. And depending on what I was doing in that particular debate, that might be tonal. So I might use green when I felt I needed to be really calm and red when I wanted to amp it up and be a lot more aggressive. I might use one color for things that they said and one color for things that we said. Um, but either way, it didn't really matter what I was doing. I just wanted to be able to look at the page and be like, I've finished that section, I can visually recognize that section, I don't need to read it to know that because I've already done that, I know I've done with that. I'm gonna move on. But yeah, I, I, there's, no, there's no like prescription, but you wanna know what it means to do things differently. You wanna understand how that's gonna change what you are thinking when you glance down and need to glance immediately back up. Um, so this question's a little bit more you know, ethereal, I guess, yeah. and it might be impossible to answer. Um, I've noticed that a lot of speakers who speak at a sort of 77 kind of range which is a lot of people in the club right now, their rebuttal tends to be quite formulaic. It's usually titled the same thing as the previous speaker's title. Whereas when I look back on speeches by a myth by yourself, even at first response, the titles, the theme of rebuttal be very, very incisive questions about the other team's case. Can you talk a little bit about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So every section of rebuttal is a mini third speaker speech. Right? A third speaker speech is not just listing things that happened. When a third speaker does rebuttal, they're not just saying, here's an argument, here's my response to it. They're thinking argumentatively. How do I argue that I won, that we won this debate? How do I argue that? What questions do I ask? And so sometimes people have had like 15 arguments in the debate. You're not going to need a head for all of them. Start grouping things. The way that I used to do it is I'd have sheets of scrap paper facts of all debate notes, whatever, I'd write down every argument that was coming up and then I'd highlight in different colours. So green is arguments about free speech. Maybe they didn't structure them that way, but that's what they're really about. I'm going to put all of those together. Because at the end of every theme of rebuttal, whether that's a third speaker speech where I've got three themes, or whether that's my deputy speech, my second speaker speech, where I've just got two and I'm just quickly rushing through them, I'm going to say what I've proven. Why did I have this theme there? Why did it matter? Why did I bother talking about any of this? Here's why. This is what it meant for the debate. This is why we won. This is why this argument mattered. This is why this thing that we said was more important than all of the things that they said. You never say things just for the sake of saying them in debate. And people, you're right, people often fall into a kind of formulaic rebuttal where you're like, well, here's a litany of things that were said. Why are we giving that litany? Why do I need to recap this? The judge has notes. So why am I talking about this again? What am I trying to prove? Otherwise, again, we just wouldn't have first speaking speeches. Yeah? Do you think a reply speech and the debate before you just clear that what she understands about what she can make out? Should you ever concede that the narrative is out and you're not going to No, that usually won't narrow the debate. I wouldn't ever concede the debate. I might concede arguments. So I might say things like, look, let's say they won that argument. I think maybe even they did. Here's why it mattered less than they think it did. Here's why these other arguments that we did win matter and have value in this debate. And I probably always say, I think they outweigh this thing they won, even if secretly in the back of my head, I'm thinking, no, that thing's decisive. <laughs> but you, you, you're conceding on a more granular level and you're doing it for a purpose, right? So you're never saying we lost that argument just for the sake of saying it. What you're often saying is, Look, we know that you think we've lost that judge. I can see even when I'm talking about it, you think that we're miles behind on this. I'm going to acknowledge that because I want credibility when I do something else. When I say that argument is less important than something else, I want you to think that I'm making an accurate assessment of that, the value of that argument. Because if the judge is sitting there and you're like, well, they have this one argument, we think it's terrible, and also these other things outweigh it, and the judge is sitting there going, that one argument wasn't terrible. It was great, it was debate winning. It's not particularly credible for you to pretend it's anything else. So what you're essentially doing when you make those kind of tactical concessions, again, they shouldn't be common, right? They're not what you're aiming for in a debate. Um, what you're effectively doing is giving yourself credibility when you make a more tactical argument about it. So we're not gonna pretend this argument was terrible, because it wasn't. We're gonna tell you why it didn't matter. Yeah. How do you like specifically do that? Which one is that you like? Like how do you say 
this is an argument that we're more important about, yeah. about just bringing you to. So the first thing is, obviously the arguments you're referring to as more important are things that you've covered before, right? What you are allowed to do in a reply stage is have what is effectively new meta-analysis. New analysis about how arguments interact with each other, that's permissible. In the same way as a judge can do that, right? No one talked about why these two arguments clash, but I as a judge am going to explain why I weighted one is more important than the other. That's always okay. So what you're essentially saying is much the same way as a judge would. The affirmative team talked a lot about freedom of speech in this debate. And they gave these arguments and we talked through them and we explained why we think they won it. But even if you thought they won this argument about free speech, let's just be clear, that was far less important than the following points that we made. When we talked about encouraging suicidal ideation, that was so much more important. Here's why the consequences of that were higher. Um, so you're not just saying, and, and if you think about that um, example, I gave the third example I showed, which is Paul Carl, um, what he's doing is saying, they had this argument, here's what it is, here's why this was more important. Um, and, it's that, and it really can be that explicit sometimes, but you can also do it more subtly. Um, they talked a lot about free speech in this debate. We get that that's what they thought they could win the debate on. But what was far more important for people in the real world were these things.
going to go on a self-indulgent tangent, partially because we're waiting for pizza and I'm hungry, and it, you'll see why. Um, who watches MasterChef Australia? Or oh, similar equivalent cooking shows? All right. This is going to be a little bit, you, you'll get it, it's funny. We're going to get there. Um, so team challenges, right, are often done. You just need to sell the food. You're not being judged on how good the food is. You're not being judged on whether it meets a certain bar. Our team for the most money wins. Right? And you'll get teams that come in and they'll try and make these really elaborate dishes that they're going to sell. And it's going to be hours of prep. Right? This is going to take forever. Um, and they're panicked, they're stressed, they can't get the portions up, so they're selling fewer dishes. And the judges are raving about their food, it's delicious, but they've only served 50 people, there's no way they can win this challenge. Make the chores. Right? Chores are very simple. You whisk some ingredients, you pour them into a bat of boiling oil, you sprinkle some sugar on them, and people will pay $7 for that. Why are you not making churros? <laughs> you see why it matters. Um, it's great to have really interesting, intelligent, fancy ideas. But at the end of the debate, you're winning on the basis of whether you want the core, the core stuff that the debate required. Right? That is the core stuff. So you just have to get into that mindset. Yeah, I've got this really intelligent idea. This is amazing. This is boundary breaking. This would be a great topic in its own right. Is it actually the topic and should I be spending time on it? Or am I making a very complicated ceviche that no one wants to eat? <laughs> so you've just got to get yourself in that mindset initially, right? So much of this, that like if you can come up with interesting, innovative ideas, you can come up with basic stuff about free speech, right? You can come up with the basics if you can do the fancy stuff. You've just got to get yourself in that mindset and you've got to ask yourself, if the judge was awarding this debate, would they be awarding it on this very niche thing I've just thought about? Or should I make a note to maybe squeeze this in if we have time for it, but I'm going to stop thinking about it now? And I know, because you're like, we've got all of these recipes running through our heads, and we're going to do some crazy stuff. You've got three hours, you need to sell a certain amount of product, make churros. Um, this has been my TED talk. <laughs> um, so yeah. Obviously, a lot of it is mindset, but there are some additional questions you can ask yourself. Um, if I was reading a front page newspaper article about a government proposing to do this thing, would this be a paragraph one? What would be a paragraph one? What would be the headline? I go to a town hall meeting. We're talking about this policy. People in the audience are putting their hands up. What are they asking about? What do people actually care about when they're talking about this topic? If I ask my grandmother what she thinks about this, what's she going to say? That's going to give you some of your basics. Now, to be clear, that's going to lead you populist. Right? So your next question is, I go to a TED talk by a famous academic about this topic. It's pitched to a layperson audience. What are they talking about? Is it theoretic? Is it the complexities of theoretical physics or is it the basics? What's the basics? What thing would be the, the three-minute TED Talk pitch on this? What would be the absolute core material? I pick up a first-year introductory tech university textbook about this. What does the chapter open with? You always want to be asking yourself that. Um, because you do know it most of the time. If you know the interesting, cool stuff, you know the basics. It's just a matter of guiding yourself to it. Yeah? Um, following on from that, second speaker material, um, Integrated rebuttal, substantive yep. on its own, how do you make this stuff effectively? Right, okay, so uh, welcome again to my TED talk. Um, <laughs> I like substantive material in second speaker. Many people do not. Um, I'm going to give you a reason, a really simple, boring reason why you should always do it, which is that if no one else is doing it and no one else is used to responding to it, they will respond to it badly and you will win the debate on the basis of your weird, cool niche stuff. Um, always have your second speaker material because it is one more set of things that you can win on. It's one more set of reasons. You never want it to be a situation where you ran two arguments at first and lost both of them and there was nothing to fall back on because that's how you lose debates by massive margins. You've got to give yourself something to fall back position.